In order to properly gauge the merits of female partnership, we can make use of the apt analogy of the job seeker, the employer, and the CV. The job description is as follows. Caring, generous, nurturing, reliable, and trustworthy. I use this description because it corresponds to the mythology attributed to women in relationships. The employer is the male, and he must examine the job applicant's CV in detail so as to come to a conclusion about the soundness of employing her. A given job seeker seeks to gain employment on the basis of her previous job track record, as well as her job-related academic qualifications. If the qualifications are lacking or insufficient, she will have reduced chances of getting the desired job. If her actual job performance has been lackluster, she will likely not get the job at all. Examining women and female behavior through the lens of both history and modernity allows us to properly read their metaphorical CV. Analogous to the academic and job-related qualifications, we have the historical track record of women spanning untold millennia. Did their historical behavior, i.e. their academic qualifications, make them suitable for said job? Did their qualifications equip them in such a manner so as to warrant trust on the part of men in the job of partnership? The short answer is no. But the no answer needs to be extended by proper explanation. The human female evolves the tools to fully optimize her own direct survival and that of her direct offspring. The entirety of female psychology is built around this evolution, and everything women do in large measure can be reduced to this and only this. The best tool she had at her disposal were the resources, intellectual, physical, financial, emotional, of men. And the female has been equipped, both physically and mentally, with the tools to take hold of male resources in an effort to improve her own lot, more specifically, to acquire security, protection for herself and her direct offspring. That is her primary interest. If that is her primary interest, then the male will be, by necessity, at best, a very useful tool with a determinable and fixed utility expiration date invariably brought about by the acquisition on the part of the female of a quote-unquote superior model, or still worse, something the existence of which is given no regard whatsoever, i.e. trash. When I speak of male resources, it is an umbrella term encompassing the totality of the male and his abilities as well as his accomplishments. In the past, the best survival strategy for the female was optimal male resource extraction without regard for his well-being. And should, it should come as no surprise to anyone that over time, this strategy and tendency became something that can only be described as congenital to the female. A careful look at the human female's metaphorical academic qualifications will reveal that she has, in fact, a BSc, an MSc, and a PhD in male resource extraction without concern for said male. And that is my title I am giving to the uh, PhD, or the totality of degrees. This is the training that women have received throughout millennia, and the training and qualifications each man should be aware of in appraising the female in her application for the job of, quote, partner. Those are the academic qualifications acquired over thousands, if not millions, of years, which leads to the further question of what actual female performance looks like at the job of partnership. Modernity, meaning the last five decades, can shed light on this. Having gained the appropriate qualifications, how females, in fact, performed at their job of, quote-unquote, equal partnership with males. Is the job performance displayed in modernity a reflection of previous female qualifications? Why, indeed, yes, it is. Has this job performance been appropriate for the mythological role and job of loving and caring equal partner of men? And should a man consider hiring the job applicant, i.e., the female? If said man has any concern for his well-being, financial, physical, and emotional, and otherwise, then the only rational answer can be a firm no. And this is because whilst females are very well equipped at male resource extraction, this occurs invariably and inevitably with little to no, to no regard for the male in question. This is in essence what we call male disposability, and it has likely been present as a phenomenon since the days of yore. Indeed, if anything, Modernity, 
taken as a whole has shown that there has been an increase in male disposability alongside an increase in female initiated and operated male resource extraction aided and abetted by the state with the state representing female interests. The state in turn ignores male interests because it is a structured form of inherent f feminism as found in virtually all females where feminism is very precisely defined as the promotion of female interests over those of any other group and specifically per force and necessarily to the detriment of females alleged partners men thus if the job offered by the man to the female is one of a loving caring trustworthy partner and given female job qualifications namely the degree of male resource extraction without concern for said male an actual job performance as evidenced by the last few million years with modernity representing quite possibly the apex of feminism as manifested by the politicized capital F feminism then only the blind willfully ignorant or indeed the opposition could possibly endorse the human female as a quote equal partner of the human male this behavioral paradigm can be encapsulated under the tenets of Briefo's law. I made a video a while back about that, and I will post a link. It is utter foolishness to believe that social and biological behavioral patterns that have been hardwired into the female can be reverse engineered by education or persuasion, no matter how cogent the argumentation. Girl Rights What has correctly assessed female hypoagency as something that simply is, as instinctual, and base as any other non-thinking process. And if this is the case, as the evidence suggests, there is very little that education or discussion can do to rectify the issue. It can, however, be rectified, but only by force. And when I speak of force, I do not mean conventional force, but the force of choice, something I'll come to later in this video. The question rightly arises from all of this as to whether or not men are as beholden to their biology with respect to behavior as women are, and it must sadly be stated that the majority of them indeed are. Men have always and continue to compete in what is termed the dominance hierarchy, wherein individual men compete against each other in an effort to gain status in order to attract prospective females. Dominance hierarchy competition can readily be translated as something Barbarossa is accurately described as unhealthy male competition. The question is, why is dominance hierarchy competition unhealthy? The first problem with dominance hierarchy competition and the problem from which all the others stem is the objective. Competition occurs not to better oneself or to improve one's abilities for oneself or to help one's uh, fellow men, but to pursue women. Quote unquote successful competitors are then scrutinized by females who use their congenital instinctual hypergamous instincts to assess said competitors. This process pits men against men in a similar fashion to war. Inasmuch as the men involved likely never had any argument with each other, men then are very willing to inflict harm, bodily and otherwise, upon their fellow men in an effort to garner female favor. In answer to the question, is men's behavior dictated by their biology as much as that of females in light of the evidence we have at hand and of the destructive dominance hierarchy competition? I'm sad to say that it is. Now, this introduction was needed to adequately refute the many specious arguments and deflections leveled at men going their own way, abbreviated MGTOW. And I'm going to run through a list of often heard arguments and I'm going to present a refutation. One argument consists of the claim that whilst men going their own way attribute to female behavior purely biological foundations, men going their own way conversely attribute to male behavior cultural foundations. Whence springs the false claim that men going their own way are biological determinists with regards to women, but cultural determinists with regards to men. As I have pointed out above, this is patently false. Men going their own way have correctly, pardon me, men going their own way have correctly assessed both female and male behavior as a result of biological conditions present for millennia and have drawn conclusions from this. 
We have correctly and sadly ascertained that most men do conform to the bio biologically dictated dominance hierarchy competition and are willing to destroy their fellow men in an order to gain access to female reproductive services. In light of this, both male and female behavior is largely deterministic, as evidenced by the fact that the vast majority and great majority, the vast and great majority of both males and females pay heed to their instincts to the detriment of their reason. What men go in their own way, however, do is the clean, complete opposite of biological determinism. Inasmuch as men go in their own way, consciously, very consciously, reject the dictates of their biology because those dictates have revealed themselves to be manifestly harmful to men, i.e. themselves. Men competing against each other in an effort to acquire female reproductive resources is the very definition of harm, as many men are willing to go so far as to kill their fellow men in order to get hold of those resources. We as men go in our own way, reject this competition as immoral, unhealthy, and dangerous. And whilst the illegitimate claim that we adhere to biologically deterministic principles is spewed forth from both feminists and alleged MRAs, it is those self-same people who themselves endorse a biologically determined game, wherein the vast majority of men lose, and lose greatly, I might add, and the few who quote-unquote win have won nothing but a creature that will discard them the minute the next best thing comes walking along. Men encouraging other men to date and pursue quote-unquote partnership with females are openly endorsing a policy that is inherently destructive to male well-being, male well -being, as men claw past each other's corpses in an effort to find the quote-unquote best female, and I use the word best loosely. Rather, we endorse men bettering themselves for themselves and endorse respect and cooperation amongst men not favoritism towards the female. We, it is claimed, pedestalize men, but the simple truth is we show concern for men, whereas others pedestalize the female whilst continuing to endorse dominance hierarchy competition. Another common deflection is the argument by shift of responsibility, as I like to call it. Using this argument, it is claimed that when men fail and suffer in their relationships, it is entirely their fault, because they were not cautious and careful enough when assessing their female partners, discounting the fact, the very open fact, that men for decades have been fed lies, fairy tales, and outright mythology concerning the nature of females, and yet the responsibility lies squarely with the male, or so it is claimed. Here, we can once again observe the phenomenon of female hypo-agency rearing its ugly head. Women did not do it, it was the man's choice. If he suffered, it was a consequence of his choices and it's entirely his responsibility. And yet, when men decide to consciously go their own way, in an act of recognition and acknowledgement and a re of and a reaction to the deception fed to them, they are accused of being closed-minded, weak, rigid, and any number of other shame-related words by the opposition and indeed by those who would claim to be our allies. In short, this is a classic catch-22. Damned if you do, and damned if you don't. Another closely linked deflection is the appeal to female nature deflection, often reduced to, it's not her fault, that's just how women are. Once again, no responsibility. And when we men correctly assess and internalize female nature, and turn our backs on it, we are called extreme. I'll give you an example. The example being, if a large predatory animal were attacking you, you would have the right to defend yourself, even though said animal might merely be following its instincts. Maybe it's hungry, and maybe that's the reason it's attacking you. It doesn't matter. Likewise with women, in recognizing female nature, we reserve the right to reject that nature as dangerous and harmful to men, and we reserve the right to practice our own form of defense, which is our turning our backs to it and walking away. A final deflection can be contained in the claim that men are bad too, or men are also corruptible, or even men start wars, which probably could be contained in the larger claim that men are violent. 
we uh, hear this very often from both uh, camps, both the feminist camp and the alleged MRA camp. And let me address this last point. The idea that men are violent and men start wars um, is only partially true. And in order to uh, elucidate this point, we need to return to the origins of war. And the origins of war lay in the acquisition of resources in order to continue the species. Close-knit tribes fought other tribes in an effort to take hold of their property and female resources. Men fought and killed each other in order to maintain their position as quote-unquote alpha male, thereby ensuring that they would have access to prime female reproductive resources. Thus, the origins of war and violence as such are quite simply the same as the unhealthy competition that men have always been engaged in, in an effort to acquire female reproductive resources, with women always, always, always taking center stage as the primary cause. Let me ask you honestly, how much intermasculine conflict do you believe there would be if females were not present and if females were not sh showing their stuff off to men, presenting their goods? I dare claim there would be much, much less conflict, perhaps none whatsoever. And I've also heard the claim in recent days that I've been divisive and have splintered the MRM, but I would state that I've merely brought to the fore what are obvious and possibly irreconcilable differences between the camps. I have furthermore been accused of focusing too much on women and too little on men, and I reject that claim as well, because until it is understood that the female lies at the fulcrum of all of our issues, and more specifically, that her congenital gift of the uterus drives us down the cycle of male competition and violence and internecine conflict amongst ourselves, we must discuss and illuminate female nature. It's unavoidable. Female reproductive privilege is the driving force behind all of this, and I do mean all of it. In the beginning of this video, I speak of force by choice. Let me explain what I mean by that. I mean simply the presentation of options, that we have options. Much as the Federal Reserve in the United States seeks to maintain a stranglehold on the dollar and indeed all currencies, banning competing currencies, so too do females along with their male henchmen desire to ban reproductive competition in the form of male birth control and still more in the form of artificial womb technology, thereby ensuring that the millennial competition and conflict amongst men is further perpetuated and forever trapping us within the cyclic nature of history. To counter this, the force of choice must be introduced. Men can and shall have the option in the future to either pair with a female and engage in natural procreation, ensuring the cycle of unhealthy male competition or opting for the artificial womb, decoupling the female from her sole source of power and influence, and thereby forcing her, liberating her, as it were, to develop genuine qualities and helpful skills and also liberating men from a cycle of violence committed for the sake of females and against each other since time immemorial. Those who profess to believe that all our current problems in regard to feminism in our age and women's behavior on the whole are merely the result of a number of flawed political policies bogged down in the silly left versus right paradigm, claiming that the right-wing political ideas are our salvation are engaging in intentional, intentional obfuscation and are ignoring millions of years of prehistory and thousands of years of well-documented ancient medieval and modern history. It is obfuscation because politicized feminism and all the concomitant problems that arose from it are not going away because you push back some legislation and those claiming that identifying female human nature as a waste of time are overlooking the very simple fact that it is female nature, whether they choose to acknowledge it or not, that has brought us to where we are. And that is the reason we are having this discussion. Let me ask you, have you read the CV? Have you looked at their job performance? Are you going to hire them?